Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to episode number 113 of Let's Go Racing with David Snyder. Tyler Jones here with you. So glad to have you with us. Coming up on today's show, going to be joined by Tim Pacman, the director of communications for Rick Ware Racing. He has done about everything in racing but drive a race car itself. We'll uh, dive into it all uh, with Tim when he joins us coming up in just a few moments from right now. Plus, we'll have our news and notes segment uh, coming up later on with the latest happenings inside the world of motorsports, as well as our Ask David segment coming up at the end of the show, where we'll answer the questions that you guys have for David and for Tim. Uh, as always, David Starr joins us fresh <laughs> off a weekend in Indianapolis. And David, what a uh, weekend it was. You saw firsthand there uh, at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And then uh, the Coca-Cola 600 gets pushed back to yesterday, but still was an exciting race. And Overall, a huge weekend for Team Penske. Man, just a great great weekend. It was cool. It was so cool to be in Indianapolis at the Indianapolis 500. It was kind of weird in a way for the last 25 years I've been in Charlotte, you know, and to, to be in Indianapolis uh, when you're supposed to be in Charlotte was kind of weird. But, man, it was amazing. Carb day was incredible. I've never seen so many people and so, enthous so much enthusiasm. Uh, for a carb day for a two-hour practice session it was unbelievable and uh, the race was phenomenal with obviously Penske uh, winning another date uh, Indianapolis 500 and then uh, and then getting to watch the uh, Coca-Cola 600 last night what a great weekend of racing it was it was Dom uh, what what a accomplishment for Team Penske Joseph Newgarden getting the win in the Indy 500 an exciting race came down to the very last lap and Ryan Blaney ending his uh, longtime uh, winless streak. He had been running good throughout that stretch, but hadn't gotten to victory lane in a while. Ultimately, he gets it done. Uh, I mean, I, I know they had to wait on that Coke 600, but I'm sure Roger Pinsky, uh, it was all worth it for what, uh, what they accomplished this weekend there on both fronts. Worth the wait for Team Penske when it came to the Monday running of the Coca-Cola 600. Our, our managing editor, Tyler Jonathan Feld, was telling us this was the only fourth time in NASCAR history that the Coke 600 got pushed to the next day. And I remember the 2009 race, Dave Rudiman winning that in a range short race. But really nice to see this event go from start to end. You saw the comers and goers, so many drivers, so much to impact with the Coke 600, which I know we're going to get to later on as well. But Tyler, an instant classic there with Ryan Blaney taking the checkered flag, his eighth career win. That ties him with Kyle Petty, 67th all-time on the NASCAR wins list, a fellow Coke 600 champion in that regard as well. But unlike Kyle, Tyler, I'm not bagging on Kyle Petty, but Ryan Blaney's just getting started. We're going to see a lot more wins from that number 12 camp. Yeah, and, you know, we, we've seen that Penske organization, David, you know, they've had their highs and lows this year trying to find consistency of some sorts. But uh, Ryan Blaney, in that stretch where he went winless, it wasn't like he was running bad. He'd been running up front and just hadn't been able to get the job done in over a year, ultimately gets that win. That's got to be a huge confidence booster, a, a breakthrough of sorts for that number 12 team to, you know, have the fruits of their labor finally pay off after running up front so much to finally get in the uh, the win column there. Yeah, no doubt about it. You know, I'd, I'd say the, you know, kind of that pressure's off his shoulders, you know, once he – you know, now you can ride into next week with a lot of momentum, 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 you know. But uh, but like you said, Tyler, uh, Team Penske, you can never count them out. Their championship caliper team got just, I mean, a dream for any driver to be driving a Penske race car, whether it be on the IndyCar side or the NASCAR side. But you knew that, you know, Joy Logano and Ryan Blaney, Ryan Blaney has just been, he's, uh, you know, he's had a lot of speed over the last you know, year and a half, and it just, for some reason, whether it was mistakes on pit road or wrong place at the wrong time on the racetrack, this didn't seem like he could, you know, get it to start finish line first when he was waving the checkered flag. But, you know, he, he again, he's had a lot of speed, he's consistent, uh, and now that he's able to put together his first win, I think we'll see lots and, you know, more to come. You can't ever count out. Uh, Team Penske ever, you know what I mean? Especially with uh, Joe Logano and I think Ryan, Ryan Blaney's right there with him, you know. So uh, you got to consider those guys, uh, you know, championship caliper and guys will be watching, I think, uh, when it comes down to the last race in Phoenix. Yeah. And, and, and Dom, if I had to kind of put a, a bowl on this weekend, I, I would think of the 
you know, in, in all three big races, you know, F1 at Monaco uh, with Max Verstappen getting the win there, Joseph Newgarden, uh, you know, getting the win for Team Pinsky in the Indy 500, and Ryan Blaney getting the win for Team Pinsky in the Coke 600. Um, it, there, there felt like a sense of domination of sorts. We know that Verstappen has been incredible all year long in the F1 series. It's no surprise that he won. Domination right for Team Red Bull. Um, you know, for Team Penske to do what they did in Indy and, you know, the Coke 600, domination on that front. Um, I know all these series want parity, uh, and we've seen some exciting racing here, but the cream rose to the top in, in all three races here. Oh, certainly. Red Bull Racing or Team Red Bull and F1. They're six for six now, Tyler. That's pretty phenomenal when you think about that. Opening six races, they're undefeated. They're batting a 1,000. Team Penske showing its dominance at Indy for the 19th time in team history. And then, of course, Ryan Blaney. And then we know the Fords haven't really been the fastest all year, but they've been fast on the mile and a half. We saw that in Atlanta. We saw Team Penske run up front. Joey Logano taking the checkered flag there. And now again in the Coke 600, NASCAR's longest and arguably most grueling race. Not to mention Team Penske is coming off a Cup Series title last year, too. Oh, that, uh, too. Yeah, how can I forget that? Yeah. So uh, we'll dive in more later on uh, the Chase Elliott and Denny Hamlin situation and the uh, suspension for uh, Chase Elliott. We'll get into that in our news and notes coming up later on. So more to come uh, looking back on the weekend. But for now, Dom, uh, we're going to welcome in Tim Pakman to the show and – Dom, uh, in case people don't know Tim Pakman, he's got an extensive history in this sport, dating back to before I was born and you were barely thought of. <laughs> Something like that, man. When you talk about Tim's <laughs> racing resume, it's pretty cool to say this guy truly has done it all without driving a race car. But even then, I, there, there's some cool stories behind that, too. Tim has worked in the industry as a PA announcer, he's worked on the media side. He's worked on the other side and crossed over the dark side to public relations. He's also <laughs> a published author a few times over. And now he, he's somebody, and it's pretty cool, Tyler, when you can think back and think, wow, I've known somebody over 10 years in this industry. And Tim's been doing that triple the amount of time I've been in this industry. So cool. And Tim and David have a pretty cool connection, which we're going to hear about here shortly as well. Tim, thank you so much for taking the call earlier this week, saying you would agree to come on Let's Go Racing with Dustin. Can't wait to hear more. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, good to uh, be on. Good to see you guys. Good to see you, David, again. And uh, you make me sound very old when you uh, talk about my path. But I prefer to go with experience. I mean, I, did, I started. I, this this was gray, and the hairline was down to here when, when I started <laughs> doing this here. So I see old pictures sometimes. Who's that? Oh, yeah, that is me. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's it. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it started in 1994 and uh, kind of just stuck around since. So before we came on here, you were telling us about that starting up in Lancaster, up in, near the Buffalo area. Take us back to the beginning, even before that. Where did that start? Where did the passion for motorsports and racing yeah. in general mm -hmm. come for you? So my dad raced, uh, my stepfather raced, and my uncle was a starter at pretty much every track around the Western New York area. He's now in the Four Score Hall of Fame. Uh, he was put in a couple of years ago. And the Four Score Hall of Fame is the oldest uh, fan club in America. And they just got recognized recently at the fan, Racing Fan Club uh, Convention in Indianapolis. So it started with that. Um, I was uh, my first job ever where I got a paycheck was cooking in the concession stand at Lancaster Speedway for a couple of summers. I didn't think anything about it. And then years later, after I you know goofed off for a while, joined the Navy, tried college, uh, I decided I wanted to get in racing and be in the and the broadcasting uh, side of it, media side of it. And so I took myself back to college in um, 1994. I got the job as the announcer at Lancaster Speedway. That led to Ransomville Speedway and and then NB, uh, CBS Sports uh, helping out starting in 97. I would uh, take pit notes and hand them to Ralph Shaheen and Dick Berger to make them look like they were smart. And then in 2000, I got the job at NASCAR.com and as a writer there and then went to Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, MRN Radio, Richard Childress Racing, back to Lancaster Speedway in 2015 as the president of the track for three years, and then uh, came uh, came back here just in time for the sport to shut down for the uh, uh, COVID and all that stuff. So good times there for a while. So, And then uh, I did some land speed racing with the garage shop, really cool stuff, going to Bonneville. And then as of January, Rick Ware Racing as the director of communications. So it sounds like, uh, Tim, just from an outside perspective, uh, a lot of that, your career is 
is due to your experience there at, at uh, Lancaster Speedway. I imagine that place got to be pretty special to you. Yeah, it's it's part of my DNA. Um, I was there a couple of weeks ago, poked my head in, the place looks great. And, you know, I get a little emotional because you go there because there's been a lot, a lot of nights there and a lot, a lot of friends, a lot of great stories, a lot of great racing. And it's uh, going back there is like going home and it is home. That's that is my home track. Hey, Tim, Lancaster, how big of a track is is it? And when did it start? And uh... So it's a 5 eighths uh, asphalt oval and a uh, eighth mile drag strip. The front stretch is the drag strip. So when we when we would set up for drag racing, we had to take the barriers off of turn one. We put barriers across turn one and turn four. Uh, it was open in 1959. I like the joke, we're one year older than the Buffalo Bills. Um, and it's, <laughs> it's hosted some phenomenal events guys like richie evans race there wow uh, jerry uh cook race there um all kind of jeff bodine race there through the years and now there's a couple guys in the our you know the nascar level that have come through there as well and so chad walters there mike hillman's been through there um a couple of the guys that you know you run into uh tj majors yeah uh, he, yep. he raced there in the yep the uh, mini cup lights um so yeah it's uh it's it's it had some good cool history and now guys like Andy Jane Kowiak, you see in the ARCA series, um, Patrick Emerling, owner in the uh, Xfinity series, Joey Gase, modified yeah. driver. Yeah, they uh, they came through there. So yeah, man, that's amazing. What a man! What a great! It's awesome that you know a lot of race tracks around the country. Um, you know that that opened in 1959 or later. You know, a lot of them aren't around anymore. So, man, you know, your hat's off to the management, the ownership, yourself, and all the people that are so passionate about it because, uh, you know, a lot of racetracks fall because they, uh, you know, the pro the property value was so valuable that, you know, with the second or third generation, they end up just selling the, the, the property because it's so valuable. And uh, it's amazing that Lancaster has been there operating since 1959 that's that's incredible and, and i guess my question to you is it the same family that owns it or is it you know no nope, the family that the people that opened it um you know they sold it to a couple of different people that went down the line and when i started a guy named by the name of alex friesen and if you're going friesen yeah friesen. Stuart friesen's uncle so i've known Stuart friesen since he was nine years old wow um, I got, wow. some funny, I got a funny picture of him and I, him and I standing together back then. And now, you know, it's a little different. And then it went through uh, the guy that owned the property. Like you talked about, David, he leased it to several people. So um, when he took it over to operate himself, he brought me on board and I left Childress, went up there and did that for three years. And we collectively, we got it, you know, in a good direction. And somehow I got promoter of the year for two years in a row up there um so it was uh it was a good thing and now the ownership group that has it it's one drag racing guy and one stock car guy so it's in really good hands now yeah, yeah that's you amazing you know Tim, like good uh yeah. you've been man your experience and you've been just doing this for so long in all aspects of it. you really know our sport inside and out yeah. and mm -hmm. uh it's it's amazing that nascar to me because i've known you for a long time it's a now it's 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 interesting to me that NASCAR hasn't grabbed Tim pa Tim Pacman and have and put you running one of these tracks for NASCAR or, or, or SMI, you know the Smith family. Yep. You know, with with your experience and the passion and the love you have for this sport, it's people like yourself that keep these racetracks going and keep you know keep our sport yep. going. You know, promoters. People that are just passionate about it and know how it operates, understand the business side of it, and and uh, so I'm I'm amazed. And maybe I don't know the story. You you probably been approached. You know what I mean? Yeah, uh, yeah we it's did. It's amazing to me that you you haven't ran you know Darlington or this track or this track on the circuit. Well, I did an interview for uh, Iowa Speedway uh, when it came down to myself and another guy that I worked with uh, at MRN Radio, and uh, David Hyatt got the nod for that. Um, so that one, and then uh, we talked about that one and after that kind of went cold and, but, uh, you know, they, they know where I am. They know who I am. And we, I know a lot of people there and, uh, I still talk to a lot of track presidents and I say, Hey, and I enjoy talking with them, talking, you know, business with them and, you know, the aspects of running a track and, uh, you know, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, I like seeing, I like, I like opening up the gates, watching the racers come in, watching the fans come in. My happiest times was to sit there and see a full grandstand and, 
you know, kids having fun and families having fun together, that, that still brings me great joy. Absolutely. Yeah. The other thing we didn't touch on too, Tim, on, on the lengthy cool things you have done in the sport. One thing I think that deserves a closer look, you are a published author. you got a couple of books mm -hmm. out there. Tell us about that process, writing a book and getting it published, and, and tell us what, what those works look like. You mean this? He's the wow. And then Funny Dan, the race car man. Yeah, that was another one. Yeah, so the first book I wrote was Bobby Elson in uh, 2003. It was him talking, and I typed, and we put the book together, and that went really well, and I enjoyed uh, traveling around with Bobby to book signings, and uh, people say, how'd you get to be friends with Bobby? I said, well, I wrote a book with him, and I just never went away. So I, I, I'm the Yankee of the, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the Yankee uh, family member they never wanted. Um, but, uh, and then the other one was uh, Funny Dan the Race Car Man. It was uh, all based on uh, people I know, and I put a story together, published that, then won some writing awards. And then PD the Pace Car came out last March. And uh, so that's been out for over a year now. And, um you know, it's a kid's book because it's just, and the car is actually named after the car that I drive. It was the pace car for Lancaster Speedway. So I used to call it Petey after my buddy Pete Trotman, who was a NASCAR official for years, and uh, put that book together. And, um, you know, that had some success, success too. But, you know, the good news is there's plenty of those left. If people want. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I have, I have more than one in my possession. <laughs> you know, Tim, I never knew you. Were, you I never knew that about you, man. That's amazing. Okay. Uh, tell us something. I guess I need to order a Bobby Allison book, man, because I'm gone. such a big. A bunch. They're gone. They're gone. We're out of them. That's amazing. <laughs> Sir, so, yeah. The Allison family, man, they've, they've given mm -hmm. so much, uh, you know, the whole family, yep. uh, Bobby, his brothers, Donnie, and just all of them, Clifford and Davey and Red Farmer, just, you know, Alabama gang, they've, get, they've given so much to the sport. Tell us something. It's interesting. I didn't know that you did that, but tell us something about the Allison family or Bobby Allison that we might all, all not may not know you know what i mean it's kind of interesting to shadow him and write a book about him how how long was that process and uh man bobby allison he was one of the all-time best and you know i know him over the years but it's interesting uh to spend that much time with him and uh when you when he when he got talking about racing did he did he get excited did it you know did it bring back great memories share some of that with us you don't mind he, he still does. Like he can, he can re like if he if he can bring up a story from the nineteen sixties, the seventies, and he'll bring up what happened in a during a specific race. And I learned a lot of, of, from him about how he treats the fans and that he he loves the fans. He knows without them they were nothing. Um, a quick story: We were up in um, Buffalo, Rochester area. I, I booked a book signing up there in several different places, and we went. We were in between, so we stopped at this place in my hometown of Akron, New York, outside of Buffalo. And we went in and we walked in the door. My dad's like, you are stop there? I go, yeah, yeah, we're going to stop and have lunch. Well, we got there, there was 15 people. When we left there, there was 75 people. People wow. were calling everybody, get to, the, get to the bar, get to the bar. And so we had lunch and Bobby's telling stories. It was like E.F. Hutton. We sold a box of books, which we thought was funny. So as we were leaving, I turned to him, I says, you really are a superstar. And that's where I gave him his nickname. And he turned to me, he goes, you, he goes, you, you know it, like being funny. So that's where I gave him his nickname. But he, um, he talks about how every, every request for an autograph is an honor. Um, you know, he shared stories about Davey and how people loved him. But um, the one thing I know about him is like traveling, he was like being around Elvis, like everywhere we go, Bobby, 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 Bobby. And we were doing a book signing in Bristol. And these people were approaching, you know, the trailer we in selling books and, and they were like shaking and they were like, they were just like, oh my gosh, Bobby. And so the books, they were 30 bucks a piece because it was a table, coffee table and had a um, CD in it of Bobby telling the story, some of the stories in the book. Well, someone, one time he, I'm sitting next to him and he goes, someone goes, how much are the books, Bobby? He goes, they're um, 30 a piece or three for a hundred. The guy goes, I'll take three. And I, I turned to him real slowly and I looked at him and he turned to me and winks. And to that day, no one ever blinked an eye paying a hundred bucks for three books. And I just was like, whatever. <laughs> One heck of a business, man. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I just, to this day, three for a hundred, I was like, he goes, hey, the extra 10 we'll put towards beer money. I said, you got it. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, Tim, what they talked about Bobby Allison when I was a kid growing up. 
man, you know, you know, Yarbrough, uh, oh, Pearson, yeah. Petty, Allison. But, you know, when I got a little bit older and in my young teens and my teenager years, you know, I learned a lot about Bobby. He raced anything and everything. You know what I mean? Everybody. He'd run an NASCAR race. The next thing you know, he'd be at a short track somewhere racing. He raced. It was amazing uh, that he raced so much. And then they, he, I remember watching him uh, land his Piper airplane uh, on the back straightaway at Texas World Speedway to come mm -hmm. run a late model race, Texas Race of Champions. And, uh, you know, and, uh, man, he – it was just amazing to kind of, uh, you know, when I started following Bobby and watching what he was doing away from NASCAR, he, he did so much for the sport and gave back to many people across America because he would show up at these short tracks. And and I don't know if they did it back then, you know, but they, they probably paid him because he was the show. You know what I mean? Bobby Allison was coming to race with all mm -hmm. the locals. And, uh, man, he was very passionate and good at it. And, and, uh, man, it, it, you know, you look at Richard Petty and Bobby Allison and, and a lot more, you know, and, and they understood what made the sport work and how it works. And, and hey, we don't – none of us are anybody if we don't have fans, you know. Yep. So, uh, interesting to hear you speak about that. Yeah, he's uh, – people say, what a great driver. I said, he's a, he's a greater man. And um, I've learned a lot from him personally. And, you know, he lives a couple miles away, so we'll get together for lunch or uh, dinner sometimes or, you know, go to family functions and – it's funny you sit there and you listen to Donnie and Bobby and they start talking about racing and this is where I go in 10 year old Tim mode and I don't say a word and I just listen to him. It's, it's kind of, it's kind of cool to hear those guys recall. And it's funny. Sometimes they recall the same story differently. <laughs> <laughs> so, selective cool. memory, I believe is that is what we call that. You know? yeah. yeah. Driver selected memory. <laughs> yes. Uh, Tim, uh, you and David uh, go back a bit, right? Yeah. Uh, some history between you two, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, I don't remember how it came about, but I, I was I helped spot a couple times for a few people, and then, um, and all of a sudden they said, "Hey, you want to spot for David Starr?" And I'm like, uh, "Yeah." So we went, and uh, I did about a half a season with you, and then my mother had uh, some heart conditions, I had to get out of it. But uh, you know, David was great. He was um, very smooth, and you, like we, I would talk, and he's like, "Keep talking, keep talking." And so they'd say, "Hey, he picks up three tenths of a second the more you talk." I'm like, "All right." So we just I just keep talking. What's going on. <laughs> And finally, like, there'd be a break in the action. <laughs> the crew chief would say, all right, spotter, quit talking for a minute. Let me talk to the driver. I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> yeah, but it was – I enjoyed it. I uh, yeah. I wish I kind of would have stuck with it now. But, um, yeah, it was good. David's uh, always been a great – You, David, you've always been great, always great to talk to, always very cordial and respectful of, you know, anyone I introduce you to. So, always yeah. been an A-plus guy in my book. Yeah. Well, so, I appreciate it. was that, Tim? What team or, how, you know, how, what races do you vividly um, for David? What's, what team was that? It was the one out of Concord. It was uh, – Man, I don't even remember, Tim, to be honest yeah. with you. There's been, yeah. we've been so, I mean, we've been doing it a truck so, series. Yeah, it was a truck series, and I don't remember what team it was, to be honest with you. Who's but, your uh, crew chief? It was George, or no, um, Connor? Who? Connor. Was Connor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Dennis yeah, yeah, Connor. Yeah. Dennis Connor, and uh, he won all those championships with uh, Hendrick Motorsports and Jack Sprague as a right. driver. And now that you mentioned that, that was with Circle Bar Racing. It that's was, what it was. Thank yeah, you that's much. what it was. Circle Bar Racing, man. Yeah, that was the rich uh, guy that owned the team and just said, "Let's go racing." So that's what we did. Yeah, absolutely, man. So, man, Pat, man, Tim, you've done so much in the sport, man. You've been on every aspect of it. Uh, you know, it'd be kind of cool one day when Tim Pacman writes his book. You know, I mean, there's <laughs> this. You know, I'm sure you're going to have to not be, out be of working. The sport. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, but man, give us, tell us some of the stuff that really, you know, tell us what you're really proud of. And, uh, I mean, for somebody like yourself to have so much experience in the sport, you've seen so much change, oh, yeah. so many things happening, drivers come and go. Just share with us some of the cool things that, uh, that you know, come to mind real cool in your career. Sure. Um, so, you know, first of all, just the <clears throat> being an announcer at Lancaster, watching all those great short tracks and it kind of gave me an understanding of, you know, racing and the passion and, you know, what the fans are all about. And then, you know, to get to work with CBS Sports for Dale Earnhardt's, um, you know, Talladega win, or excuse me, Daytona 500 win to be part of that. And then going to NASCAR.com and then being covering the whole sport and get to know everybody. 
and then going to Dale Earnhardt Incorporated, winning two 500s there uh, with Dale Jr. and Michael Walter. That was in you know, 03, 04. That was pretty cool. And people talk about, you know, how'd you get into PR? I'll tell you the story. Um, Martin Truex Jr. just started driving for well, Chance 2 Motorsports, part of DEI. Well, the guy that he was had as his PR guy quit and went to uh, work for a, a bus company, Johnson Bus, and now he's um, Josh. And so they walked in. It was uh, Dale Jr. and Martin. And they walked in. They go, oh, hey, hey, thanks for being our new PR guy. Appreciate it. Shook my hand and walked away. I didn't, I didn't have a say in it. They didn't ask me. They didn't talk to me about it. And that's how it started. So that's how the public relations part started. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to learn writing from, you know, a PR point to writing from, a, you know, a reporter side of it. So that's how that started. Uh, uh, cool days. Um, go back to Bobby Allison when he was um, announced for the Hall of Fame. I was sitting next to him down there. Um, and I kind of knew because we went down, I used to like walk ahead of him and tell him, okay, when you walk in there, you know, this, this and take a left. So I walked him to where he was. And I turned to leave, and the girl from NASCAR Communications goes, oh, why don't you sit down with him, Tim? I go, I go, no, no, it's okay. She goes, Tim, why don't you sit down with him? And I went, oh. So I went and sat next to him. So that got announced. I got emotional. We sit down. Later of the top, the five, they announced Ned Jarrett, who was sitting to my right. So that was pretty cool. And I'll never forget, Daryl Waltra didn't make that class. And he's over there, and they're all interviewing him. And I'm like, what are they talking to him for, Bobby? I said, you're in. And he goes, yeah, what's up with that? I said, look at it this way, because Bobby was part of class two, the first 10. I go, now you have one more top 10 than him. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but no, it's just it's just been a lot of surreal moments. Um, I, I, you know, being on you know the front row with Dale Jr. when he won the 500, I'll never forget looking up in the stands and at Daytona. I'm like, oh, my God, this place is going crazy. It was a snapshot in my mind. And, you know, just being part of um, – just the different teams and being a promoter of a track, you know, being the person that was running it. I enjoyed the business aspect, the operations. Um, but it's it's been a lot of cool moments of meeting people I never thought I'd meet. Muhammad Ali, um, all kinds wow. of people you get to talk to and get pictures with. And it's, uh, you know, a lot of times I just sit and stop and go, man, that was pretty cool. Um, you know, with Richard, I met all, you know, all kinds of people with him, the circle he traveled, you know, with the NRA and, you know, Ted Nugent, you know, because came to a function. I talked with him for a while, one of my rock and roll heroes, and um, just the different things we did with him and and just the learning about the NRA and his how he ran his business and what he did, his personal touches. And I have a lot of respect for that man, and he uh, I still use a lot of things he taught me today uh, in everything I do. So let me ask you this, uh, you know, in case folks may have been wondering what Donick was referring to at the very beginning of, the uh the dark side going to the uh the PR realm of things uh it, it's always uh an interesting predicament of sorts down I can attest to this between the media and the PR side of things and sometimes it's great sometimes they butt heads you know I mean you know just just like any other industry that has to work together of some sorts what about for you Tim what was it like going from the media side over to the communication side and what are the big differences uh, between the two for, from what you've seen? Uh, first of all, it's the size of the room. I mean, the media center for the, <laughs> the media is this big. The PR room is like this big. Um, it, it was good though because like it, it was good for me because I already had relationships with all the media. So they come to me and say, or I go to them say, hey, I got something going on. They knew I was coming with them for something of value. Um, a lot of times people say, hey, I asked to have so-and-so. He didn't do it. I go, yeah, sometimes they just don't want to do it. And they don't answer. And you got to be the person to say, hey, um, yeah, we're not going to be able to do that. And then there's some of them that come through, even now, I'll look at it and go, yeah, this isn't really worth it. You know, you have 110 viewers and you're, I'm sorry, you know, it hurts your feelings, but it's just, it's not, doesn't fit into what we're trying to do here. Um, but, you know, the Rick Ware Racing now, I've got, I've got Rick, I've got, you know, the drivers that we go through, um, Newman's back again. So him and I reunited after it, um, R Richard Childress days, um, you know, we had Todd Gillen this weekend and J.J. Yaley. Um, there's a guy I give a lot of credit to. People don't realize all the stuff. He had a USAC champion. Uh, he ran an Indy 500s, Indy car. I mean, you know, they, they dismiss him sometimes. But if you really talk to the guy, he has got a, a heck of a pedigree and a resume in racing. Absolutely he does, man. He, uh, you know, you don't go drive for Joe Gibbs. Joe Gibbs don't put you in one of his cup cars just, just for the heck of it. You know what I mean? That says a lot right there. But J.J., 
Yaley has done lots in his time and still doing lots to, to finish 16th at the Coca-Cola 600 yeah, is just phenomenal. That's amazing. Yeah, I don't know if that's y'all's best finish ever at Rick World Racing, but it's got to be close. Uh, no, we had we had uh, we had tenth in the uh, Daytona 500 this year with Riley Herbst, right? And we had a fourteenth too, uh, right. as well. And, and we've uh, and it was back to back uh, top twenties for the team at the Coca Cola 600, which you know is pretty good. And and you know people, I'm going to say this: people knock on Rick Ware Racing. That guy, Rick Ware, has such passion for racing. I mean, he 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 lives and breathes it. It's all he talks about. We talk about things. And so he decided he's going to have two cup teams. Oh, let's start an. In, let's keep get involved with an indie team with Stingray Rob, <laughs> Dale Coyne Racing. Oh, wait a minute. Let's get. Let's buy an NHRA team from Doug Stringer, uh, Clay Milliken. We just won. We're coming off the big win at Route 66 in Chicago a few weeks ago, and the Top Fuel. And let's see the, the IMSA team. Uh, we just got Juan Pablo Montoya in there. Uh, Pietro Fittipaldi's a driver, and then he has the Supercross uh, teams as well. And now we have right now going. We have two flat track motorcycle teams. Uh, so on any weekend I'm covering or paying attention to or, you know, doing social media updates on all these things taking place at once, but um, uh, never lack of excitement uh, with Rick. That's for sure. So you're doing uh, not just NASCAR, but all sorts of stuff there at Rick Ware Racing. Yep. yep. I'm involved with the Indy side has kind of their own team, uh, but the NHRA, the flat track, uh, IMSA, yeah, so involved that in the World Supercross that they race overseas. Um, so I'm not going to, I'll try to stay up for some of the races, but <laughs> I'll, I'll watch them as best I can. But yeah, so I'm involved with a lot of the communications with all that. So, so tell me this uh, from, from your vantage point, you know, we mentioned you haven't been there too long since January of this year. Um, you know, there there have been some highs for you guys, what you did in the Coke sure. 600, the Daytona 500, but there have been some lows too. You know, it, it's no secret what's gone on with, with Cody too. What, what What's that been like of just being a part of the team? And and I, I know that, you know, you don't have any control of the outcomes of things and such, but um, but just being a part of those uh, those emotional highs and lows and and dealing with that, I, I'm sure that, uh, you're you're just as invested as anybody, right? Sure, definitely. I mean, personally too, because you know you get to know someone and you, you spend a lot of time with them and talk with them a lot, and then you know things happen. But from my vantage point, unfortunately, I've had a lot of experience with crisis communication. So basically, I just put that hat on, put your statement out, state what happened. Here's our position, and that's it. That's it. and then I'm not trying to be cold, but that's that's what you do. You just have to say here's. Here's what's happening. Here's what the results, and that's it. And um, you know, you feel a lot of questions and a lot of stuff you can't talk about for legal reasons and or whatever. It's a it's team, you know, team proprietary information. But it's it's you just you just got to go through it, you know. And well, that's I, a matter of fact I, I, about everything. Rick Ware is a class act. Him and his yeah. wife, their whole family, just they're great people. And you know, all I can say is. Uh, Whatever happened to innocent and pro until proven guilty is one of the things I want to say and all I'm going to say. But Rick Ware is a class act. Been a great friend of mine for 30 years, and uh, was was a great a great race car driver himself. We used to motorcycles too. Yeah, uh, I didn't race with him on the motorcycle side, but on the NASCAR side, I did for years. And uh, he was a great competitor. But man, once he retired from the driving side. It's amazing, uh, and, and I'm always amazed, and I talk to him a lot about this, but, you know, what he's done and, 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 and the whole uh, spectrum of auto racing, and Tim, you were just sharing with us all the different teams, He, you know, just to be in the Indianapolis 500, to have two cars in the Coca-Cola 600, and just everything else behind Rick Ware Racing – is phenomenal. I'm proud to call him my friend, and it's uh, you know, we, we we don't skip a beat. I don't see him for a while, and then I see him at a race, and uh, just a, a great guy. And I'm proud of what he's done because it's phenomenal what he's done, and and it's a shame that that what he's doing and how he's done, he doesn't get the recognition that he deserves. Uh, but but man, and Tim, you said it, you you spot on, man. He he loves it. He drinks it, he eats it, he sleeps it, and he's very passionate 
and and I, and I think in the future we'll hear more about Rick Ware racing. You you got no choice because he's running good. All his teams are to make the. I mean, the drama field just to qualify for the Indianapolis 500 was just amazing there. Uh, but man, Rick has done so well for himself, and uh, it's cool to see that. And Pac Man, you're such a great guy. It's it's such a great fit, and uh, you know Rick has put a great team in place, and uh, seeing you there. Tim is uh, is a, a good addition to his cool program. Well, well it's funny. So North to that too, David, I mean, look, looking at Rick Ware Racing bringing on Tim Packman to run the communications, and Ryan Newman joining the organization. I mean, these guys wouldn't be joining that organization if they weren't onto something. That's just my well, opinion. Tommy Baldwin. We just got Tommy Baldwin as director of competition. Robbie Benton, former team owner and racer himself. He's our president. Um, you know, he's got his hands full with a bunch of things, but. This is this epitome of everything happening once. So we're at North Wilkesboro. The All Star Open is starting. All of a sudden, Robbie comes out. And he points to my phone. I look. Well, we find out that Clay Milliken just won. Like he not only went past the first round, which we hadn't done all year in eliminations. He just went out. Went first round, second round, got to the finals and won the top fuel race. Thirty five minutes later, all of a sudden, Stingray Rob, he's in the Indy five hundred. And meanwhile, I'm trying to do what I got to do for the U.S. Uh, the All Star Open, and I'm like, okay, which way do you go here? So literally. I had to pull over on the way from North Wilkesboro and start, you know, posting stuff and revising it and just get it all out. And I was in the media center doing some more stuff, and it was all just – it was, like, all cool at the same time. And Tim, you know what was cool about that day? What? I mean, I was – when I saw Rick, I saw Rick uh, – I saw him on card day. Uh, and, man, he pulled out his video and showed me that win. It was amazing. He showed me yeah. the phone is in, yeah. in there. And – uh but what you left out, y'all won the race, the drag race. You're qualifying for the Indianapolis 500. And, oh, by the way, both of your cars are super competitive and probably would have finished in the top five, top six yep. at, mm -hmm. at, at, uh, at uh, North Wilkesboro. It was amazing how good your cars were. Yep. Ryan uh, Newman was coming on. Yep, Ryan Newman was coming on. He was running fastest. Three laps was fastest uh, on the track. And he was working his way up towards the top five. And then he got caught up in someone else's jingle and that kind of ruined it for him. And then JJ Yaley just did his and he finished sixth. Um, but it was, yeah. So it, the program is improving in so many levels. And it's, and of course, people can just look at a result and go, uh, but they don't know what it took to get to that point. So when you start having, you know, the top 25s and the top 20s and, and you're, you're there at the end and you're, you know, instead of being four or five laps down, maybe one lap down, but you, you know, you're racing with the group of people that you're in, like any of the other teams. Um, you know, it, it's little by little, it's all starting to come together and, and look a little um, little better uh, for well, everybody. I think, I think you can objectively say that Rick Ware Racing uh, on the NASCAR side for sure is headed in the right direction, that there's building momentum uh, to where what you guys are trying to accomplish and where you want to go, the things are uh, – that the better days are still ahead for this organization. Um that things are, are looking upward and certainly exciting uh, on that end for you guys. And, and uh, we'll be rooting you on for sure. Uh, plenty more to uh, get to with Tim in uh, just a moment. We'll have our uh, news and notes segment. Also our ask David segment coming up uh, at the end of the show, where we will answer questions that you guys have for David and Tim both. But first let's go ahead and find out the uh, headlines going on in the sport this week. Dominic, take it away. We'll take it away. We have a lot to unpack and, with that coming from the Coca-Cola 600, some of the headlines out of that, NASCAR is staying consistent with its policy on intentional wrecking on mile and a half. NASCAR driver Chase Elliott is suspended for the weekend ahead at Gateway or Worldwide Technology Raceway. Corey LaJoy, in a one-off deal, will be driving the number nine car for Hendrick Motorsports, where Carson Husevar will be fielding the number seven car for Spire in LaJoy's place. So you have one driver making their debut, LaJoy making his debut and arguably the best equipment he's ever had in the Cup Series. And you have your 2020 champion sitting out a race. No word yet on at least the time of the posting of this podcast. If Chase Elliott will be granted a unprecedented second waiver. And from according to our friends at Kicking the Tires, Jerry Jordan's website, no driver has ever requested a waiver twice in one season. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out, Tyler. But a lot just heading into this weekend with Chase Elliott, Corey LaJoy, Carson Hosefar. Yeah, well, let's let's slow down one 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 thing at a time here. Let's start with uh, the Chase Elliott suspension there, David. Um, 
I, hard to argue that it wasn't the right call by NASCAR uh, with the precedent that is set and with the evidence that Diddy Hamlin laid out, even on social media, uh, to the suspension. Hard to argue with that. To me, the, the, the big surprise is just NASCAR actually doing it, of holding their most popular driver accountable and suspending him. It, it, that, to me, is is the big shocker, surprise all this, is that uh, – you know, if they'll suspend Chase Elliott for this, then they'll suspend anybody for for doing this. Basically, they're they're making a statement here. Well, you got to be consistent. I mean, what happened and uh, what we all saw and what happens. I mean, it. Hey, sometimes our frustration gets the best of us. You know what I mean? I mean, maybe you had this, this same run in with the same driver two races in a row, maybe three races, but you know, I think. Uh, Frustration got the best of uh, Chase Elliott, and uh, it's just a, a reaction. Uh, you know, if we we had sat back and could think about it for a second or two, you know, probably would see that same reaction. Uh, but Chase Elliott's a, a great champion on and off the racetrack. It's just, hey man, if if he didn't, if he wasn't such a great champion and had passion and love what he does, then he wouldn't have done what he did. You know what I mean? And but my hats off, my hats off to NASCAR because, you know, as a sport, as a governing body, and Tim Packman can tell you this, you got to be consistent no matter who it is, uh, you know, and, and you know, uh, you got to be consistent. I hated it for Chase Elliott because he needed to have a good run there at Charlotte. He needs some points, and uh, you know, you, there's got to be accountability. You know what I mean? And uh, you know, I think the sport is doing the right thing because it's consistent. You know, we saw another driver do that. Uh, and anytime you uh, you turn somebody on the right rear quarter panel coming off turn four, turn two, I mean, especially turn four, a lot of these trial with these dog legs, man. It, it's at the speeds we're going. It's just not something that needs to happen. You know what I mean? And, and look, I'm guilty of it myself. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, I'm not sitting there putting blame on everybody. Sometimes the frustration because we're passionate, we all want to win. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, at least it's accountable, but it is dangerous, man. You right where somebody in the angle, you hit that wall at the speeds we're going, you know, NASCAR did the right thing. Well, I thought it was funny that uh, ahead, Denny Hamlin had the data and he yes. put it out there and he's like, look, everybody, look what happened. And I was like, so, you know, I don't get privy. I don't get to see the interviews and everything because, you know, I'm working the race. Right. But afterwards, and I knew I knew Chase Elliott was guilty because when they were talking to him, he did the old hat adjustment and then turned his head and he did everything but look straight ahead when he said, you know, when you hit the wall, these cars are just, you know, hard to drive. And I was like, you're done. You're done. Right? So, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you're right. Consistency, like to add to what David said, when I ran Lancaster, I went in there having 20-year friendships with drivers and people I knew. And I said, look, I don't care who wins. Just be legal, and that's what you got to do. Yeah. Now, what about the opportunity here for Corey LaJoy, Tim? This is a guy yeah. that laid the groundwork several years ago when Jimmy Johnson stepped out of the 48 car, wrote a handwritten letter wanting an opportunity, just said, please consider me. Um, go to Spider Spire Motorsports, and a uh, very similar operation to you guys there, Rick, we're racing him, and he has done a – terrific job to get the most of what he has and worked his ass off uh the last few years and here we we know that they have the hendrick alliance and everything and now he gets this golden opportunity to perform in that uh nine car here hard to find a more deserving guy a, a happier story in nascar than uh gory Le gory lejoy getting his shot here yeah i remember when his dad used to walk him around and introduce us introduce him to teams that had drivers that were you know, in and out and everything. And he was, and uh, we fly on the same plane as Spire. And so I got to know Corey, you know, through the years. And I think it's great that he's getting to do this. I also think it's great that, you know, Spire said, yeah, go ahead. And Carson Hosevar, I've got to watch him race late models the last couple of weeks between Hickory and North Wilkesboro. And he's another one just passionate about racing. But uh, for Corey, I, I hope he does well. I hope he doesn't try to, you know, make a whole career out of this one race. Um, you know, some Portland being in where the, Xfinity races, it kind of opened up the door. So to have Spire and Hendrick work together and make this happen, uh, that's pretty impressive, too. David, I know you've been a fan of Corey for a long time. Uh, what's a realistic expectation? What would be a good day, you think, for Corey in that nine car? 
Well, I think he, if he just does what he knows how to do and, and just works for the team and just, you know, just gets out there, top 20 finish, top 15. And, you know, I mean, you're stepping in to, uh, some some really good equipment. I mean, and, and like Jim said, you know, they're alliance together and they work together. I think it's a perfect fit. I, I just hope, uh, you know, uh, the outcome is good for Corey and the team. I, uh, I'm i just glad for, for him to get the opportunity that he deserves. And, uh, you know, um, you know, you just got to treat it like any other race. You know, you, um, you know, just because it is Hendrick Motorsports, it's hard not to, you know, you're overexcited and all that. I just hope he has a great race. I hope he surprises the hell out of everybody, you know, and, and, uh, you look what Josh Berry has done. Josh Berry has just done a phenomenal job uh, in, in the uh, 48 car, you know, and uh, and now look what it's done for him. He's going to replace Kevin Harvick, I believe. I believe that's what I'm hearing. Uh, yeah, I, talk, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, you know, Corey Joy, I mean, very deserving, great race car driver. I would like to see him one day get a shot at a, at a more powerhouse team, you know, the team – that he drives for, they've done a phenomenal job himself. But to step into one of the powerhouse team cars, I mean, I, I don't, you know, anybody would want to be in a court of Joy's shoes. So I just hope he takes advantage of the opportunity. I hope it all works out. But uh, however it works out, he still has a good ride, and he'll be racing in Cup Series for a long time. And, you know, when I heard about it, Something it brought to, that I thought thought about, and Tim Pacman can, you know, a long time ago, years ago, I don't even know what year it was, might have been in the 80s, but my good friend Jimmy Means that I've driven for a time or two, Jimmy's been in, in the sport as an independent for years. And Jimmy had an opportunity years ago, and I don't know what year it was. Uh, it might have even been Tim Richmond's car, and I could be wrong about that. Uh, but Jimmy was able to jump into a Hendrick Motorsports car back in the 80s, I believe it was. And unfortunately, I don't remember what happened. The outcome wasn't too great. And he really, I don't think he ever got a shot after that one shot that he had to ever drive anything like that. You know what I mean? So when I heard Corey DeJoy was going to drive the Hendrick Motorsports, it kind of reminded me of Jimmy Jimmy Means did it for Hendrick years ago. You, you know about that story, uh, Tim? I do not. Uh, I, I'm not going to sit here and say I did. I haven't been around that long. But, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I, I think what Corey needs to do is just treat it like he's jumping in his own car and just Absolutely. go race and do what he does best and not, you know, seek beyond what the opportunity is. But, you know, the thing is, his personality and, and Noah, like the Noah Gregsons and those guys like them, those are the guys I like. They like have fun doing this. And I think we're lacking that type of uh, – personality but i i think that um yeah you know good for Corey. i'm, I'm sure he's gonna be like have some sleepless nights but at the same time uh, i hope he just you know tempers it and just says he'll do the best he can do so this interview should be interesting coming up to it for yeah. sure Dominic, one more thing on this before we move on just the the what if scenario let's say that Corey lajoy finds a way to to win this race and then all of a sudden he's in the playoff picture and I know the Spire car wouldn't have the owner points, but if they just had a car running for the driver championship, that would be a huge deal for Corey and that organization, even if he got the win in the Hendrick car. Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, in even worst case scenario, this guy finishes 16th in points, but he makes the playoffs. He's a winner. That just changes his stock. That just changes everything around Corey LaJoy and his trajectory. We, we can see, you hate to say how one race could make or break somebody's career, but certainly an outstanding event like Corey LaJoy having a great run or even winning on Sunday. You got to imagine Tyler that that would just only pay dividends from here on out for him. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and it could happen too. I mean, uh, watch out. We'll see. Don't rule out the possibility of Corey uh, getting it done here. What else is going on, Dom? I have a quite real quick question. What Go if ahead, he does win? If, if Corey does win, does, does Spire pay the bonus or does Hendrick? <laughs> <laughs> I think they both do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, That'd sorry, be a ahead. great problem to have. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, Dama, what else going on? We have another NASCAR triple header weekend, but two different events. We're going to have the NASCAR Xfinity Series out at the road course in Portland for the second straight year. NASCAR Trucks at Worldwide Technology Raceway. 
hey, we're David one back in the day. And then the Cup Series visiting for the second time this this upcoming year. So it's going to be pretty cool to see, Tyler. I mean, we don't have, as of right now, as of the time and taping of this podcast, the odds for the Enjoy Illinois 300 this weekend. But you got to imagine. William Byron having a career year. His odds are probably 5-1, to 6-1. to one. Kyle Larson, Martin Truex Jr., who led a bunch of laps in this race. Joey Logano, the defending race winner. A lot of good drivers that you could pick from on Sunday. Guys that haven't won. We saw that winless streak come to the end with Ryan Blaney. Brad Keselowski could be somebody to watch at Gateway on Sunday. I really like this track. Uh, I thought they put on an exciting show. They had a sellout crowd there in St. Louis for the uh, first ever cup race there at that track. Uh, the Midwest, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Midwest guy myself, and and I love seeing that the uh, the support that's shown in the racing community and NASCAR returning to Chicago this year and all that. Uh, it's exciting, David. You you've that place means a lot to you, Gateway. Uh, th this should be a uh, exciting race on Sunday uh, there at, at Gateway for the uh, the second straight year. Man, it's really cool. Gateway is such a unique racetrack. It's like a Martinsville, you know, but much bigger. And uh, uh, it's it's really unique in the way it's you know the turns from one and two are so different from three and four. But man, the race fans in that part of the country are over the top for NASCAR. And when they announced that NASCAR Cup Series was going to go to Gate Gateway, I was just extremely excited and surprised, you know, because it's not one of the bigger markets that we race at. But man, you know, and Tim Pacman might he might have. Uh, the stats on how many seats, how many people it it, uh, it's, it seats. I don't know if it's that much, but, man, that place is sold out last year. It was amazing, and uh, and it's not going to disappoint again this year. And the race was phenomenal, you know. And, and just hearing y'all, hearing y'all who's the favorite, man, I don't know who the favorite is. There's so many that are running so good right now. I just know we're going to see another great race. And and I hope Rick Ware racing, Yaley, or whoever's driving the 51 car, I hope that Rick Ware's uh, team has uh, impact. Man, I hope you all have a, another yeah. top 15, mm -hmm. top 16 finish. I think that'd be awesome. That'd be great on a track like that. I'm not sure of the capacity, but the thing I like is Coca-Cola 600 sold out last week. And then there was still a really good crowd there on Monday. I got to give all those fans credit. Yes. And, and you know, and being in near a metropolis like that of St. Louis, it's like, okay, well, they don't really have many options uh, to go see a NASCAR race. So, you know, it's easy to go to. It's a destination place. Um, so I give them a lot of credit for that, that, you know, they're they're doing what they're doing, their marketing and their product they're putting on track. And as far as going back for the cup teams, now it's the second year of data they have on these new cars. So they're all going to be a, a little bit smarter when they go back this weekend. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Pac-Man, who's, uh, who are the guys you're, uh, you're watching out for? Who do you think's going to be running up on, uh, up front on Sunday here? Uh, I think a track like this, uh, plays into the hands of, a, a, De a Denny Hamlin. Uh, I think, uh, well, Blaney, you know, winning produces winning. that will be a good thing there. And you got to give Joey Logano, uh, credit for what he's probably going to do there as well. The guys that, you know, enjoy those, uh, smaller tracks are successful at those. Um, if I, I go for a long shot, uh, I like to go for a long shot once in a while. You you got to look at um, you got to look at Corey. I mean, with no doubt being in that equipment, and that's just the way it's going to be because once that race starts, the temperatures are going to be in like the mid nineties, so it's going to be a stamina race too. It will be. Uh, I'll say this, Dom. Uh, maybe I'm pulling to David. Uh, you know, going with consistency here. You know, David loves to pick Kevin Harvick every week. Um, I, I, I uh, the way that William Byron is running up front every week. It's hard for me to pick against William Byron. He, he's he got the most wins. He's consistently up there everywhere we go. He's great at every track. Uh, no reason to think he won't be running up front again on uh, on Sunday. I'm, I'm watching out for William Byron. What about you? All right, man. William Byron's a good pick. I got to go with somebody that led a bunch of laps in this race last year. Almost closed the deal. Almost, I mean, almost isn't winning, but I think he gets it done on Sunday. Martin Trex Jr. gets win number two of the 2023 season. Uh, we mentioned Xfinity going to Portland. Uh, last year they they went well. Dom, that, that was their first trip back to Portland, right? Uh, last year, correct. Yes, they're their first trip back to Portland last year, and this will be the second consecutive year of doing yeah. that. Uh, the, the, the second year of basically a brand new weekend with uh, with St. Louis and uh, and Portland split up between the two. David, uh, you know, you, you've been a part of a lot of these Xfinity standalone races and. 
uh, over the years. And th- this is an opportunity for these guys. You're not going to be having cup drivers running out there. Portland uh, is the only NASCAR race in the Pacific Northwest, um, you know, of, of any of the top three circuits. You know, you, you, you go to that market there and everything. This is a, a real unique opportunity for those Xfinity stars to shine and and uh, and have the stage themselves there in uh, the Pacific Northwest in, in Portland where there's plenty of race fans that uh, have been eager for an event like this. Man, up in there, Seattle, Washington, Portland, Oregon, uh, that part of the country, there's uh, lots of race fans up there. And, and uh, man, the Portland race last year, I don't know what the attendance was, but, man, there was a lot of enthusiasm. The fans were excited to have NASCAR Xfinity Series, some kind of NASCAR series back up in their area. And I think, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, you'll see the same thing with attendance wise. And, uh, you know, it's kind of cool to have the NASCAR Camp World Truck Series or the NASCAR Xfinity have a standalone race. And uh, to do it in that part of the country, I think uh, is uh, very smart on NASCAR's part because man, the, the fans come out of the woodworks because they love their NASCAR up there. And, and, uh, and again, uh, does give uh, all the regular Xfinity guys more of an opportunity or more uh, time to shine because you don't have any cup guys stepping in the, into the series because of the, the distance between tracks. You know what I'm saying? So I think it'll be a great r- a race weekend uh, for the Xfinity series, the standalone series, and, uh, and, uh, and it's going to be a fun race to watch. Yeah, for sure. Uh, Dom, one more note before we uh, move on from news and notes here. Uh, the much-anticipated Garage 56 uh, will be uh, making its debut uh, with the uh, 24 Hours of Le Mans uh, coming up here. Big deal for NASCAR and for Hendrick Motorsports, Jimmy Johnson, Jordan Taylor, and company here uh, to put NASCAR uh, on the uh, center of the uh, the world stage here, one of the uh, biggest events uh, in, in not just motorsports, but internationally in all sports here. Oh, absolutely. I'm working with the, the Chevrolet Camaro ZL1 that they've been working and having all the test sessions and pretty cool to see some of the videos coming out of that. And I, and I think, too, adding the name Mike Rockenfeller to that, he's made some NASCAR starts in the sports car racing. You have a great star-studded lineup. Very eager to see how this is all going to turn out. Yeah. Uh, Tim, uh, th- this is a unique opportunity for uh, not only Hendrick Motorsports, but for NASCAR to uh, – be on uh on, on stage like that to get international uh publicity here well it's going to see the uh, technology and the engineering of nascar and what they've done collectively to work together to get in there so i'm looking forward to see what the all the practice and all the the you know i hate to use the word hype but all the preparation and we'll see interesting to see what happens when it gets on track and gets to race against other cars how it turns out yeah david th- they're not going to score this car this is a special entry but even with that, it, it, it feels like there's a, a lot on the line for Hendrick and for NASCAR. It feels like that they're, they're going in with a, a chip on their shoulder, something to prove here. Well, I mean, I, you just look at the engineering and the design and the, and, uh, the technology. And, and, you know, you're talking about NASCAR and Hendrick. So, I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know for I, I think you'd be foolish not to not – to, consider them it's a big test for them but man nascar and, and hendrix i mean it's just there's a winning combination right there uh they're going to gather a lot of data uh i can assure you that however this turns out they will build they will be building a winning car if it's not this coming weekend you know what i mean uh, i mean they have all the technology engineering uh, you know, and I don't know, I, I'm going to be focused and watching because it's so interesting to have our sport of NASCAR involved in, in this with teamed up with Hendrix. And, uh, man, when you think about that, man, all I think about is win, win, win or winners. You know what I mean? It's, uh, if they don't win the race, uh, they're going to learn a lot. And I can assure you when they go back to the racetrack that, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know two better entities to bring to better to bring together to to uh, to uh, uh, have this opportunity with. You know what I mean? So yeah, yeah. One one more note on this, and we'll move on, Dom. Uh, just real quick, with Hendrick doing this, we know about their partnership next year with Arrow McClendon 
and, uh, you know, getting Kyle Larson in, in that car for the Indy 500 the next couple of years. Hendrick uh, is quietly expanding their operation uh, to an international uh, organization here. They've dominated NASCAR for so long and been such a big name in American auto sales, but uh, watch out. I'm very interested to see what, what more we're going to see out of Hendrick Motorsports here. Well, and it kind of reminds me, too, we were talking earlier about Rick Ware Racing and expanding and trying all these different disciplines. Rick Hendrick is doing the same thing here, too. When you think of goals and you think of aspirations and things you want to accomplish and you hit those, what's the natural thing to do? You want to set those goals higher. So we're seeing that with Le Mans. We're seeing that with Indianapolis. The only direction it appears up Tyler for Hendrick Motorsports and it'll be fascinating to see what other entities we see them get involved with. But this this Indianapolis entry in 24 and 25 for Kyle Larson. I mean, I wouldn't have even thought 10, 15 years ago that Rick Hendrick would have given a blessing for any of their drivers to run Indianapolis. And here we are. Let alone be co-owner of the car. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> it was it was cool to be a uh saw um Kyle Larson on Sunday at the Indianapolis 500 on the grid uh, five minutes before they announced, gentlemen, start your engine. And he's like, man, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, well, I, I have some sponsor meetings and, uh, you know, and I said, I said, well, I, I'd ask you the same question, but I already know, you know, and he laughed. <laughs> he said, uh, uh, he, uh, Kyle said, man, I, I'd love to stay and watch the race, but my, our plane's leaving in about 55 minutes, you know, and he just said, I wish NASCAR would uh, call the race in Charlotte so I can stay here, you know. He was uh, – was all I the seen, rain, yeah. Yeah, I've seen him several times in the garage area. Uh, you know, he uh, he's doing his homework. I asked him if he tested an IndyCar yet. He said not yet, but he was looking forward to doing that uh, soon. And uh, it was just kind of cool to see him in the garage, see him on the grid, and just see what he was doing. You know, pretty cool. But uh, but man, I can assure you, you know, I think, uh, I, and I don't know this for a fact, but y'all might all know it. But I think McLaren is teamed up with Hendrix, and seeing how fast and how good the McLaren cars ran at the five hundred. I think, man, when you when you plug in Kyle Larson, even though he's going to be a rookie, I think you got to consider him a favorite for next year. You know what I mean? Just because he's so talented, and I and I'm excited to to see how the testing goes, and 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 uh, you know to see when when he starts testing, just to kind of keep up with that, because I I think it's going to be good to myself. Oh yeah, I mean he he's our generation's Tony Stewart. He's good in anything he drives. You know, absolutely. All uh, I'm, I'm very excited for him. Uh, as you mentioned, yeah, it's a, it's a co-ownership thing there with, uh, Aaron McLennan and Hendrick Motorsports and Aaron McLennan has been fantastic in the, uh, the F1 side of things in addition to IndyCar. So a lot of great minds coming together to make this happen. Before Batman, what's your, what's your thoughts on that, Jim? I, I, as a fan, I can't wait to see him get in there and see what he does. I mean, you know, Jimmy Johnson went and did it and, you know, not to compare, but not Larson drives a lot more different types of race cars and let's see if that all pulls together and what he does when he gets behind the wheel of that Indy car. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think Kurt Busch did a phenomenal job when he was doing mm -hmm. Jimmy did too. Uh, you know, and man, to watch those guys qualify and the drama that played out this, uh, when they were qualifying and how fast they're going, yeah. it's amazing, man. But I, but I think Kyle Larson, I think he's going to, I th I'm excited for him because uh, he's going to be a contender. Yeah. I think so. Uh, moving on, our Ask David segment, our final segment of the show, where we ask you to submit questions to us on Facebook and Twitter uh, at Star Podcast. Also by email, davidstarpodcast at gmail.com. And our first question in the inbox this week uh, is for Pac-Man. Uh, mm -hmm. This one comes uh, from Ron. Ron wants to know, Tim, what's your best David Star story? <laughs> I got okay. I'm gonna get you on this one. So when we were working together one time after the race, I can't find David, and all of a sudden, I'm like, where is he? He's between the hauler and the tractor doing push-ups. I go, what are you doing? He goes, I do 400 push-ups. I'm doing 400 push-ups a day. I go, you just ran a race. He goes, yeah, but I got to get my push-ups in. But uh, that's one of my one of my favorite things. I remember. Like you know, I'm like looking at him, like I'm looking at myself, going, I'll do four push-ups with you. <laughs> Not 400. <laughs> Man, uh, most, always gonna, 
David's always been a, a good, upstanding guy. And he he treats people with respect, and uh, you know he's never been a above you type of person as a driver, and he's always been a a good human being. So there you go. But the push ups got me still. Yeah, man. Most most of these guys know me. You know, uh, they uh, you know that's you know I'm so busy during the day. There's no excuse why you can't you know get your exercise in. You know, and it's funny. Pac Man, I uh, you know working in my shop all day today, my my employees laugh at me because when I go to use the restroom, I usually come back huffing and puffing. They said, "Did did you do another seventy five push ups?" I said, "Yeah, you know I got to do five hundred today." You know what I mean? I try to I try to do five hundred every day. You know, and they just said, "Man, you're nuts." You know, but you know we, it just you know when you're busy working on race cars, you got to run a business. It ain't like I can stop for two and a half hours and go to the gym and work out. You know what I mean? So. I try to stay active to stay on top of my game. Uh, so, man, just I remember back then, you know, today I don't do that. When I go to the racetrack, that's my exercise, you know. But I remember years ago, it didn't matter if I was racing or not. I had to get four or 500 push-ups in no matter. It was no, there was no excuse, right. you know. And people said, man, you're nuts, dude. I said, well, it's just the way it is. <laughs> that's great. What, what about you, David? Uh, what, what's a good – Tim Pacman story. Man, Pacman, one one of the things <laughs> is uh hell, I, I I don't remember what year it was and even what vehicle I was driving, but Tim Tim had said, Hey man, I I can spot for you. You I'm gonna be your spotter for this race. And uh next thing you know, I don't know, 30 minutes or an hour before we practice start or whatever, Pac-Man couldn't make it and they said that well he can't now, you know what I mean? So I always gave him a hard time and said, Man, Pac Man, I Thought you was going to spot for me, and you checked it, checked out on us at the last minute. You know, you had something bigger and better come up. <laughs> no, my, my mom and her, my mom is having a major heart surgery, and I ended up having to care yeah. for her for a while. But yeah, I, I let them know like a week ahead of time. They just didn't tell you in time. A absolutely, that, man. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm, always, I'm never trying to leave anybody hanging. Yeah. So Tim, one of the things, man, I didn't get to ask you earlier. And I'm going to ask you real quick, and 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 y'all bear with me. Um, what's left for you, man? You've done everything in the sport. I know you're at Rick Ware Racing, and you're, and you're, you know, you're bringing good to that organization. But before it's all said and done, you know, you obviously, you, you know, you probably got 15 more years, 20 more years in the sport. What's uh, <laughs> what's left for what's left for you to accomplish, dude? You've done it all. You know, what would you like to do? What you, you know, how would you like to finish this thing up? Well, you know, um, Warren Brosell and I, we started up our podcast, Pub Table Racers, during the pandemic. It's kind of a joke, and it. Kind of took off and we turned into like a little business. Uh, I enjoy that part. I, I think I, I I don't know what's really left. I mean, you talk about the track running. If I get a call, sure, I'm going to listen. I still dabble in the broadcasting. And I, I guess I just I just want to stay involved. That's it. I, I, I've been on the outside and I, it's, I hate it. It's terrible. It's awful <laughs> to watch a race and you're like not involved. But um, I just I, I think just still staying involved and making making a difference. And that's what I like about Rick Ware Racing. I he said, why'd you go there? I said, because there I can make a difference. I'm not one of 20 in black pants and white shirt just doing whatever. I mean, you're you're heavily involved and you know, and you're you're part of the team in many aspects more than just one. So um that's it. I, I, that's all I want to do is just kind of stay involved. When yeah, it's no, time yeah, to end it, I don't know. Yeah. That's but awesome. 58, it's closer than it was 30 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you, yeah. man. Uh, another question in the uh, inbox uh, for Tim. Uh, oh. This one comes from Ryan. Ryan wants to know, Tim, who is the best personality at Rick Ware Racing? Rick. <laughs> Hands down. Rick, Rick is – Rick is uh, that, that hairdo that he has. I call, I call it wear hair. It's, I call it wear hair. <laughs> wear hair. Wear hair. That's what I call it. And, and he, 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 just, he just – like one minute he's all serious and stuff. You know, poke his head in your office, and he goes, "You gonna do anything today?" And like your desk is covered, and you all stuff. And you look up at him, like, "What?" He goes, "Are you gonna do anything today?" I go, "No, nah, I think I'm just gonna sit here with this big mess and stare at it." But uh, he, he's got a great sense of humor. But yeah, he is definitely the eight on one personality. Rick Ware Racing. <laughs> wear hair. That's a new one, man. I can't wait to see him. Now. That's awesome. Hashtag it's That's... wear hair. Yeah. <laughs> w -A -R -E H a r r. Yeah. He had it going good so when I seen him this weekend, man. He had that wear hair. It was, oh, it yeah, was all definitely. it was amazing. <laughs> That's great. Tim, been a pleasure to uh, have you, you with us. Uh, 
plug away. Where can people uh, follow and see everything that's going on with uh, Rick Ware Racing and uh, with what you're doing, man? Okay, everything's Rick Ware Twitter, Rick Ware Facebook, Rick, Rick Ware Racing Twitter, Rick Ware Racing Facebook, Instagram. Those are our top three. Uh, it's Tim Packman at Instagram, uh, TPAC64, sorry, Facebook, uh, Tim Packman, Twitter, TPAC64, and then uh, Monday nights, uh, 8 o'clock on uh, Facebook Live. It's uh, Pub Table Racer, so I get to have my little fun doing podcasts, too. Awesome, awesome. man. That's great. Great oh, stuff. If you, want, if you want a book, contact me directly. <laughs> free signatures. Free signatures. You know, awesome, man. Awesome. So I work with a guy that uh, his name is last name is Peterson. We call him Petey. I, I need to get him that book. You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, uh, before we go, uh, real quick, just kind of around the room, what's uh, what's going on this weekend? Uh, Dominic, start with you. What's uh, what's going on in your world? Well, oh, man, you know, it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm sure we've all been there. We have to move from one city to another. We're officially moving back to Grants, New Mexico. And Moving from Santa Fe, that's a 120-mile drive one way, two hours. So have a moving company help us get back to Grants. That's going to take up most of our weekend. It's going to be fun and stressful with all of that. But when, when you have a moving company helping, that takes away a lot of the stress, I feel. So that's going to keep me busy this weekend. And, of course, we'll be following the racing action along. We're going to have our Joe Larquente, a friend of the show, out there for us at Gateway this weekend. So we look forward to seeing what he's able to provide for the team. There you go. Awesome stuff. Uh, David, uh, what's going on with you? Man, I just busy week. Just uh, uh, just cleaning and uh, doing a maintenance on all our Team Texas race cars. we got an event coming up uh, next week. Uh, i got to shoot a commercial on uh, Thursday, get on an airplane early Friday morning for a sponsor meeting, get back to Texas, get back to Dallas. Uh, my, my youngest little boy, Vance, will be racing Saturday uh, night. Uh, and, uh, man, just, uh, lots going on, but, uh, but, uh, looking forward to watching some good racing this weekend. There you go. Uh, how about you, Tim? Uh, cup is in St. Louis. We talked about that. NHRA is in Epping, New Hampshire and IndyCar is in Detroit. So I'll be, uh, watching with all, all eight of my eyeballs watching all that's going on there. So Tim, what, where will you be? Will you be at the cup race? Will you be at the yeah. drag races? Where are you going to no, be? I'll be, at, I'll be in St. Louis. I'm, I'm primarily assigned to the cup, but anytime that could change and they could just, you know, send me wherever. <laughs> Have you ever done multiple where you left a cup race and flew up to here? Not yet. No. I haven't done that yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. What about you, Tyler? What are you doing this weekend? Oh, uh, Hanging out, uh, just enjoy myself. Uh, we we kicked off the uh, the summer of Jones last week, uh, much to David's surprise, uh, in uh, in Washington D.C. But uh, keeping it easy this week, and uh, I'll see y'all in uh, in Nashville here in a few weeks when the Cup Series heads down there. So that should be a good time. But looking forward to that's my, that's my next race. I can't wait, man. Yeah, exactly. everyone's got to do Nashville. You got to go to Nashville. Absolutely, that's a yeah, great. Give a, who cares about the racing? We're going to Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, got to make like, it. Like Dominic here is talking about going to Atlanta. I'm like, what are you doing? Go to Nashville. <laughs> oh man, if looks could kill. I just feel all that on the room. But I think that's a good segue too. Before we leave, Tyler, our next guest next week. We were plugging it last week on the show. Joseph Wooten of the Steve Miller Band. He went to his first NASCAR race in Nashville a couple of years ago, and we wanted to get him on ahead of the Nashville race. So I'm sure he's going to give some convincing, compelling arguments on why I should be going to Nashville instead of Atlanta. Yeah. Uh, I guess you're not the uh, the space cowboy or the gangster of love. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, looking forward to uh, talking cars and music with, uh, with uh, when he joins us next week. Uh, all things the uh, Stevie Miller band and more. Uh, so look forward to that. Uh, big thanks to uh, Tim Pacman for joining us. Follow all Thank of you. Rickwear Racing, and we'll be uh, rooting them on uh, this weekend and beyond. And uh, David will be uh, back in the racetrack we mentioned here in a couple weeks in Nashville. I'll be there as well. And uh, make sure to subscribe to the show. New episodes out each and every week, wherever you're listening to podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. Leave us a five-star review or don't leave us one at all. Uh, and also hit us up on social media, Twitter at Star Podcast, Facebook at Star Podcast, and by email, davidstarpodcast at gmail.com. For David Starr, Dominic Aragon, I'm Tyler Jones. We'll put the checkered flag out on this episode. We'll see you right back here on another edition of Let's Go Racing next week. Thanks for joining us.